There's a fire. Good evening. Uh, for some, good afternoon and welcome to tonight's Geography of Hope presented by Alaska Wilderness League. My name is Monica Shear. I'm the director of Outreach here. I'm sure many of you know me at this point uh, here at the League. And I'm coming to you tonight from southeastern Pennsylvania, the traditional homelands of the Lenape peoples. Um, and I'm so thrilled to see so many of you uh, have joined us for tonight's discussion with Dr. George Devoki scientist, bird enthusiast, and climate convener. Um, this very special episode of Geography of Hope um, for so all of you, our league supporters, yeah. members, and volunteers, and is our small way um, to Maybe show you our frozen. appreciation yeah. for all the ways in Sorry for the for the mute. We're just making sure everyone's muted here. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, tonight's episode um, is special for all of our supporters, members, and volunteers, and our small way of showing our appreciation for all of the work in which you guys support our work and campaign here at the League. Um, and just a quick highlight, in three weeks, on March 29th, we're going to have our next Geography of Hope program titled From the World of Film and Television to Protecting the World, the Importance of Indigenous Representation. I will be joined by Princess Dajra Johnson, a Gwich'in writer, director, producer, actor, and advocate, um, an amazing, amazing individual. Uh, her and I will discuss inclusion and representation through storytelling. Uh, we'll go over her new short film and her hit PBS show, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, Molly of Denali. Uh, we'll hear about Princess's inspiration for the show, we'll discuss why elevating indigenous perspectives is so critical if we hope to achieve a more diverse and inclusive conversation about conserving all our wild places. And then before I introduce tonight's guest, a few quick housekeeping items to help make sure you get the most out of tonight's program. As you can see, and we just made sure, all participants will be muted for the duration of the program, just to help assure that everyone has the best listening experience possible. George and I will be having a conversation following his short presentation, and I will be asking him questions that you, the audience, um, bring up. So please, please feel free at any point during the program tonight, um, type in any questions you might have, or uh, if there's something you'd like to have our guests speak more to, um, and we will be sure to cover them during our uh, really engaging conversation. And then if for any reason, if you miss part of tonight's program or you wanna listen again or share it with your friends and family, it is being recorded and we'll be sending you a link tomorrow to the full recording in a follow-up email. And speaking of that follow-up email, uh, in the chat, you'll see this evening, my colleague Lois will be sharing some links to additional information and ways you can take action as they relate to the conversation uh, we have this evening. We'll also be sure to include all those links in that follow-up email in case you're joining us by phone or just don't want to take the time this evening uh, to click during tonight's program. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome tonight's guest, Dr. George Devoki. Uh, in 1972, George found a colony of Black Guillemots on Cooper Island, which is a barrier island in the Alaskan Beaufort Sea, um, which began an ongoing long-term study of the colony in 1975. So his nearly half century of summers camping on the island have allowed him to witness major changes to a rapidly disappearing ecosystem. Dr. Devoki has worked for federal and state agencies on a range of Alaska seabird management and conservation issues and is currently the director of Cooper Island Arctic Research, which is funded by the Seattle-based nonprofit Friends of Cooper Island that we'll be highlighting later this evening. Um, his research on Black Guillemots of Cooper Island was featured on a cover story in the New York Times Magazine uh, in PBS's Scientific American Frontiers program and on ABC Nightly News and Nightline. He's appeared on The Late Show with David Letterman. He's been interviewed on NPR, and now he can add Alaska Wilderness League's Geography of Hope to that impressive list. So without further ado, I'm really excited to welcome tonight's guest, Dr. George Tavoki.
Yes, sorry, this is much better. Can you hear me now? We can. Good, okay, great. Yeah, um, I used to have my public events as being something that would get me out of my solitary existence because I would be in a room with a bunch of people. And so this is somewhat different in that I'm in a room alone, but I'm really glad that you've, that you've been able to join me. Um, I, uh, I was thinking about this audience. I think about the audience that I'm gonna be speaking to. And if it's ornithologists, it's one thing. Uh, if it's oceanographers, it's another. And then I realized the thing that we have in common, and hopefully, I mean, we almost certainly have in common, is a love and concern for Alaska. Um, so, so all I can, you know, so that in terms of my credibility is that I started going up to Alaska in 1970, and I've gone up every year since uh, because I was so taken with the place. Um, and what I'll be talking about today um, is my. Um, is my um, uh, time on Cooper Island, Alaska, which, which, which started uh, in 1970 when, when, when I was at the Smithsonian and it, it looked like they were going to have to take, uh, take the oil out of, out of Prudhoe Bay uh, by super tankers because someone was holding up the, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. And what I realized is that as I was thinking about this is that there's always been this push pull in terms of what's taken me up to Alaska. It's either been helping or uh, uh, it's, it's, it's either been the exploitation or the preservation of resources. And this was a situation where they were gonna be uh, drilling for oil in Prudhoe Bay. They couldn't build the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. So they had a series of cruises in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas uh, to see what was there because of the fact that people were seriously thinking about taking a, uh, super tankers through the Northwest Passage to the East Coast, which they did once with the Manhattan, which went to Prudhoe Bay, got 155 gallon drum of oil and went back to the East Coast, badly battered, and they realized they couldn't get oil out that way. But I did the surveys uh, from 1970 to 73 um, to see what was there off of off, off of Prudhoe Bay and also in the in the in the adjacent Chukchi Sea. Now, just so you know, this is the Chukchi Sea. I'm, I'm sure you all know just north of the Bering Strait, and the Beaufort starts at Point Barrow and extends over into uh, into. Sorry, George. Uh, we don't see your slides yet, so you've got to share your screen real quick. <laughs> I'm sorry. What? Um, you have to. Sh are you trying to show slides already? Oh, I'm sorry. I no. no I. Okay. I'm I was sharing it before. <laughs> well, thank you for doing it because once I got 15 minutes into a talk. Uh, um, ah, we got you now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, well, I, yeah. Well, as I was saying, uh, but at, as I was not showing, uh, um, I have been uh, going up to to Cooper Island because of the fact that, um, that they were uh, thinking about uh, taking super tankers into the Arctic Ocean because of Prudhoe Bay uh, uh, oil, uh, not being able to be put down the trans Alaska pipeline quickly. And it was, it was a sign of the times. And one of the first EISs that had to be written was because of, uh, of, the, of, of, of the state of, uh, of how, how the nation viewed conservation at that point and didn't and and things that had been passed in the late 60s and and like early early 70s meant that that people had to think about the environment when they were doing any sort of industrial development so so uh, prior to building the pipeline they were going to be taking super tankers to the east coast the manhattan was taken through the northwest passage um, and I went up to the, uh, can you see the Chuck GC there? Are you seeing that? Yep, yeah, we're seeing that. Okay, good. And uh, I, I went up on a series of cruises at Chuck and the Beaufort Sea to see what seabirds were there as part of a general oceanographic survey that the Coast Guard Oceanographic was doing. Uh, and I visited all the barrier islands on the north side of Alaska, including, including Cooper Island, which is a low sand and gravel bar. Uh, 35 uh, kilometers, 25 miles uh, east of Point Barrow, Alaska. I had this ideal summer in 1972. I was, I was dropped off at, at one end of the island by the Coast Guard helicopter pilots. I walked the island censusing the birds that were breeding there, typically gulls and terns and things like that. And then was picked up at the end of the day and taken back to the ship. And it was, a, it was just an excellent time uh, because I was doing Lewis and Clark type, type natural uh, 
history, just seeing what was there because no one had really censored those places before. So one of the islands that I visited was Cooper Island, 972, and I was very surprised to find a colony of black guillemots on the island. Uh, black guillemots are cavity nesters, and there, there are no cavities uh, for seabirds uh, on the northern Alaska coastline because there are no rocky shorelines. It's just low tundra bluffs that are breaking off into the sea. And some boxes that had been left there by the Navy in the 50s um, had, had, had guillemots breeding, breeding in, in them. Um, this was very exciting to me. Um, I turned over uh, some structures in, in, in uh, July of 72. And when I came back in August, found that guillemots had taken over some of the sites. So I thought, oh, this is something. I can, I can actually have this colony increase in size, um, which I, which I uh, did, uh, but never thought that I would be going back after that. Um, I, I turned over wall boards. Uh, I took various boxes like that. And uh, and made what what clearly were cavities that guillemots could 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 breed in. Um, in 1975, because of the Arab oil embargo, there were uh, grants and contracts to go study seabirds in Alaska, where offshore oil development was going to be taking place. And I um, got a grant to go study birds at the ice edge. And because no icebreakers were going north that year, I said, well, I can go back to Cooper Island because I know it's at the ice edge. So I went back there in 1975, and again, because of exploitation of Alaska's resources, uh, went, up to, went up to Cooper Island and started my now uh, almost 48-year study. Um, as I said, Cooper Island is a low sand and gravel bar and um, is around uh, six to eight feet above, above, above sea level. And what I did uh, in the 1970s and 80s is I took whatever wood was out there. Um, whatever had been left there and made nest sites for these, for these birds. And I topped it off with uh, 200 nests or 400 places for birds to breed um, um, in, 19, in 1980. And people will ask why I stopped at that point. And it was because Ronald Reagan was elected and I no longer had funding. So, so I didn't have a field assistant. So I had to basically do the whole colony on my own. So when people say, what was the major limiting factor for your colony size? It was, it was, it was basically Ronald Ronald, Ronald Reagan. Um, but I, I, I did create uh, a black guillemot colony uh, that I could study. And I did this mainly because seabirds are so hard to study because they breed on cliffs, they breed deep in talus and scree slopes and things like that. But this colony let me access all of the nest sites. Um, unfortunately, that same access was a problem because things that were trying to disturb the guillemots um, um, uh, came came in the picture as I'll talk about later. So I replaced all of the wooden nest sites um, uh, that had been out there. In 2010, I took out plastic cases that I had modified so that they could be nest sites. So now all the breeding on the colony takes place in plastic nest cases uh, that I can easily access and that can't be easily disturbed by nest competitors and predators. So in response to, to my building the sites, uh, guillemots moved in very rapidly, and this became the largest black guillemot colony in the state. Um, and it was it was mainly done at that point to build up a sample size because I was interested in studying seabirds that would allow me to say something about what was going on with with any breeding parameter um, and and have a big enough sample size that I could I could I could see uh, um, uh, I could make some general statements and and not and not have to be have it be based on just the 10 pairs that I found there in 1972. So my, uh, my, um, uh, my uh, uh, wanting to study seabirds started by looking and, and reading about, uh, about British seabird colonies. And I always expected that I would be studying seabirds and, and possibly guillemots at a place like this, which is, which is an Irish uh, black guillemot colony. Um, and unfortunately, I've been studying the seabirds at a place that looks like a parking lot with a bunch of wood in it with these birds that could be pigeons just walking around. But again, I mean, it, it was a very good place for me to work because I have a fear of heights. I didn't want to work on a, on a, on a cliff. And it also provided uh, um, access uh, to, all, to, all, to all nest contents. So just to tell you something about the species I studied, Mansplat guillemot is the... Is the uh, uh, is the uh, Arctic subspecies of the black guillemot that's found in Maine and in Great Britain. And it is very different from those in that it is an ice obligate. It is found next to the uh, sea ice 
and is an, is an Arctic cod specialist. So um, um, one of the rather important things about it is that it uh, has to have a nesting cavity for the female to ovulate. The eggs are formed after 16 days. Um, then the eggs are incubated for 28 days and the chicks hatch at around 35 grams and have a major growth increase over the next five weeks to close to 350 grams, have a, have a, have a tenfold increase and fledge at close to adult weight. So they require an 80 day, uh, they have an 80 day nesting period and require a nest cavity for that period of time. Um, they are the only, they are, they are one of the few seabirds that is tied to the cryopelagic ecosystem, which is a system that used to be very important in the Arctic and is rapidly disappearing. It is based on, uh, on an algae bloom that takes place uh, in the ice and phytoplank phytoplankton bloom that occurs under the ice that then feeds zooplankton that are fed on mainly by Arctic cod. It is the classic Arctic system that has very few trophic levels. So that Arctic cod are the main prey uh, species that is eaten by any upper trophic level predator in the Arctic that, that eats fish. And one of the things about that is, in, uh, is, that, is that essentially uh, uh, black guillemots are repackaged Arctic cod and anything you see in the Arctic uh, polar bears uh, are, 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 are repackaged Arctic cod. And I find that a good way of thinking about the fact that these are parts of a food web and the changes in them, uh, changes in these upper trophic level predators mean that there is something that is going on with the, with the primary prey that they depend on. Guillemots are also a great species to study because they are very tolerant uh, of, being, of, being, of being handled. Um, and uh, since I can e catch them easily with noose mats and also ban them when they're young, I can ban both the chicks and the adults rather easily. And having known individuals in a population lets you uh, control for a wide range of things. Uh, it also engages one at a very deep level. One of the reasons I went back when my funding ran out is because I had a bird that I had banded as a chick that was then around 10 years old. And I realized I have to go back and see if that bird whose band combination was white, orange, gray is alive and how it's doing. And it was that sort of uh, compulsion to, to like maintain my um, relationship with individual birds as well as the colony that has kept me going back. And we now have seven generations of birds because, be, because we know who, who, the, who, the, who the parents are of any bird that has fledged from the island and then, and then comes back. And also one of the reasons that I kept going back to the island, one of the reasons I like to say is that they are a very attractive bird. Uh, uh, when you get a low light midnight sun, and they have a slight iridescent uh, green uh, sheen on the, on, the, on the head and neck. Um, they are, I mean, it's great to be in the colony and be out there with them. So prior to my study starting, uh, nothing was going on with climate change globally. Um, uh, uh, there was, uh, you, can see where the, you can see where the red dot is, where, where like Cooper Island is. It was even in an area that actually cooled a bit, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the previous 25 years. Um, during my study, there has been major global warming, um, and, uh, and, and, and Cooper Island has been at one of the places that has warmed the most. Um, again, there was no way that uh, people are accused of saying, oh, sure, you saw climate change happening because you went out and tried to find it. I didn't try to find climate change. I was studying birds. I was studying birds for 15 years, and then climate change happened. Um, um, and and, and I, I frequently wonder if climate change hadn't happened, how long the study would be going. So, um, so, so I have seen major effects from the atmospheric warming that has taken place uh, 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 as I have studied the black guillemots on Cooper Island. Um, um, there, have, there have been changes, and, and, and for those of you and for, and, for, and for all of us who care a great deal about the state of Alaska, this is a scary uh, map because it shows the change in the average and, uh, and annual average temperature from 1975 to last year. And you can see just how there, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is warming everywhere and it's really warming in the Arctic. Um, that has caused the sea ice, which used to be directly adjacent to Cooper Island to, uh, to, to have this sort of ice retreat that was seen in 2012. Um, so major changes are taking place because of this, of this, of this atmospheric warming. 
and uh, Vero, Alaska, Utkiavik, uh, now Utkiavik, formerly Vero, Alaska, uh, you can see that the changes that have taken place in terms of the average annual temperature there. And what is kind of strange, I mean, and people say, how did you happen to pick this colony? I mean, this is what's happened during the course of my study. And if anyone thought that I knew, uh, you know, after the first 10 years when not much change was going on, what was going to happen uh, as we entered the 21st century, um, you know, I'm not that, I'm not that prescient and I'm not that smart and I'm not also not that paranoid. Um, um, uh, as that warming was happening with the atmosphere, the ice uh, conditions off of, off of, uh, off of Utkiavik have changed greatly. Um, you can see that uh, that essentially the first part of my study um, uh, had 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 ice relatively close by uh, in September, uh, and and basically the September ice reflects what was happening in August also. But that you can also see what's happened in the late 20th, early uh, 21st century is that basically the ice concentration has gone down to zero, and as the ice has melted, more solar radiation could be absorbed. Uh, so as a result, sea surface temperatures have greatly increased. And these are really, I mean, I don't know if there's any oceanographers, in, but I mean, these are major changes to have taken place to an Arctic water mass that was, that was typically in the summer, maybe two degrees Celsius uh, maximum, and now, and now has temperatures uh, uh, as, high, as high as seven. Um, do you want me to stop for a second? If there's any questions, have you had any questions yet? Any, any questions yet, but it's a good pause to just remind folks, feel free at any point to type them into the chat um, and we will be sure to get to them during our conversation and I've got my eye out for them. Okay, great. There are a bunch, there is, there is a great deal of information about the atmospheric uh, that, that, that like caused this and also, also, the, also the CO2 emissions and various things like that, which I really can't go into. But of course, we all know that, this, that, this, that these changes were driven by CO2 emissions uh, and fossil fuel use that has that has that has warmed uh, the atmosphere. And again, this is a nice graph for people. Not a nice graph, but it's a graph for people who are concerned about the whole state of Alaska, as to what's what's happened not just during my study and in my study area, but but like what has happened to to average temperatures uh, in the state and just how much things have changed. Uh, since the late 70s, I mean, since since the since the time I started doing the work on Cooper, and this is uh, a good regional breakdown showing that Southeast has basically avoided the worst of it. But you know, up until recently, that sort of increase would have been seen as something that was pretty scary. But compared to the six degree Fahrenheit increase in the Arctic, um, seems somewhat benign, um, which is kind of. Um, Sad that that like that like we now have a totally different scale on which we're looking at uh, at regional warming, and in terms of in terms of warming, you know, two or four or six degrees, Barrow, uh, Alaska, Utkiavik uh, has been a place uh, that in the past its climate always straddled zero degrees Celsius or thirty two Fahrenheit during the during the summer uh, for my first twenty to thirty years up on the island. It was it was very common uh, on on like most nights for the temperature to dip below freezing and for and for uh, for the sea to get an ice skim on it and things like that and if you have a change of temperature of four degrees if it's 28 versus 34 say 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 if it's six degrees uh, in that situation you have a change in in you have a phase change for water going from ice to water or water to ice which changes everything. Uh, if you have, if you live in Seattle, Washington, and it is like 48 degrees and it goes up to 54, you don't notice that. You don't notice that because, because like, because nothing goes through a phase, phase change uh, at, at that point. But, but since the, since the Arctic coast has always been very close in the summer to straddling 32, these changes have made, have met major changes in the summer uh, environment up there because snow is melting earlier, ice is melting more. So how has climate change affected black tail moths? Well, it turns out that the formation of the Cooper Island colony, and this was something I didn't realize until doing the study for, oh gosh, maybe 15 years or so, uh, that the colony was probably formed due to atmospheric warming. Um, I got out to the colony in 1984 early, and I didn't know the island was totally uh, covered with snow, as were all the nest sites, and, uh, and that the birds didn't arrive until there was some snow melt. 
So, um, so it was clear that, that, that the timing of snowmelt, and we have since have many observations of how, how correlated the birds arriving on the island is with the, with the snowmelt, how, how they are basically waiting for the, for, the, for the snow to melt so they can go there. And the females can't start forming eggs until they get into the nest cavity. So, like, so, the, so, the, so the breeding season can't start until the snow is, is, is melted from the entrances to those, to those nest cavities. We didn't uh, realize how uh, critical that was until 1988 when we had a major snowstorm and a, and a series of cold days where, where we had snow drift around many of the nest sites. Uh, like this nest site, parent birds were coming back trying to feed their young and they couldn't get to the nest. Uh, they couldn't get to the chicks because snow had come in. And 1988 was the only year we've had since 75 where the snow-free period was less than the 80 days that the guillemots require. And, uh, and, and, and what we did is, is well, what, what happened is luckily there was a somewhat of a warm spell. So many of the chicks were able to fledge. If we saw chicks losing weight to the point where they were going to die, we then moved the snow out of, out, out, out of the nest site. But I know that was wrong. I know that there's natural selection for, for birds that don't do that, but I'm not going to weigh chicks to, up, up until the point that they die. But, but, but this, I mean, of course, being out there and seeing all this really was like, oh my gosh, you know, in the past, if it was a less than 80 day uh, snow free period, uh, birds could start breeding and then would probably not be able to breed successfully. So if we looked at, at the duration of the snow-free window in Utkiavik, we can see that, that uh, up until the late 60s, uh, it, was, it was very common to have summers that only lasted 80 days in terms of the period that there was no snow on the ground. And that the first breeding that was seen at Point Barrow in the late 60s happened uh, right about when that window opened up. And then, and then when I found a colony in 72, it was, it was as that window was opened up, even more so that so that even finding the guillemots here in 72, I probably wouldn't have been able to find them in 62 and certainly not breeding successfully. So, so that, uh, I mean, to me, this indicates that they, that they almost certainly colonized uh, uh, Cooper Island shortly before I got there. This to me is also a very scary map and it has nothing to do with birds or anything else is that I now realize is that summer is basically one month longer and this, this, uh, this doesn't even go up into the present day, than it was when I first got there. That, that I mean, that basically that there is a, that there is a 30 to 40 day period where, where the ground is snow free, um, that wasn't there in the past. And again, just the fact that I was uh, studying this colony during that, during that change uh, was, was something. So, so colony growth was facilitated by the continued atmospheric warming. Uh, in part due to the graph I just showed you, uh, and also the fact that that uh, that the date of egg laying is highly correlated with the with the with the date of snow melt, and that now the birds have much more time. In the past, it would it would take the early bird to lay the egg. Uh, now it's, it is a situation where a bird could, in theory, get there a week late, lay eggs, and still be successful. So that the so the so the colony was now open to a larger number of individuals than when the snow-free window was very uh, short. So, so that almost certainly helped that rapid rise in the population that we saw. This is one of the things that can happen. Uh, and and it, 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 it can snow any day of the year on Cooper, and I've seen it snow every day of the summer. It rarely snows this much. This was around four years ago, and I happen to have a motion-sensitive camera next to a nest site. Uh, in late June, and there, there, is a, there, there is a parent bird, and this just shows what can happen if you do have a mid-season snow. I mean, luckily, I mean, as you can see, it basically melted out in one day, but, but snow coming down and blocking access to nest cavities uh, can be a major uh, disruption, which is why that snow-free window now has to be as big as it is for the colony to be that successful. So, um, the, so, so, so climate change has also affected the black guillemots by, by decreasing breeding success as, as the loss of sea ice and the increase in sea surface temperature has decreased prey availability. Um, Cooper Island uh, is surrounded by ice in June. We, in the past, would frequently go out there by snow machine over the ice. Um, um, and uh, and dur 
during the, dur during the course of the study, the ice retreats. Uh, this would be a classic mid-July um, uh, situation for almost any year from 1975 up to maybe 1995 or so that the ice was in that close proximity to the island. And then in late August, uh, the ice uh, is, is pulling off shore more. So what is important about this for an ice adapted species that wants to feed under the ice on Arctic cod uh, is that during the period it's breeding, its habitat is either being uh, uh, is either moving away or becoming uh, of 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 a lesser quality, and that and that the that that the most rapid uh, loss of that sea ice occurs while the parent birds are are feeding 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 their young. Um, uh, chicks hatch uh, roughly in mid July and then are there until maybe early early September. Ice retreat uh, is is most rapid during that time so that all the guillemots, and these are like five uh, parent guillemots coming back with Arctic cod, um, are, are basically going out and, and trying to find cod in an ice habitat that is pulling offshore uh, during, that, during that critical nestling period. And it really is, and I've only, to be, honest, to be very honest, have come to appreciate this recently, Guillemots feed their chicks one fish at a time. Uh, many seabirds that feed some distance from the colony go out, eat a great deal of food and come back and regurgitate it to their young. Guillemots feed typically within five kilometers of their, of their, of their, of their nest site. Uh, and they have to feed that close because they are bringing back only one fish and they are feeding essentially constantly, uh, feeding, feeding their two chicks constantly. And that that uh, and in this situation, they're all they're all they're all they're all bringing back Arctic cod. They need, in addition to the 80 days of a of a cavity uh, that that can protect their eggs and young, they need a prey population that will sustain itself for 80 days, uh, so they can so they can raise their young to fledging weight and have them and have them uh, fledge at a, at 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 a decent weight. So. What we started seeing in 2003, after 28 years of, of, of Arctic cod being essentially 95% uh, of the prey every year, is that there was an alternate prey that started coming in, which is the four-horned sculpin, um, which, uh, which, which would show up sometimes in nests, but, but, but we never saw it be the primary prey being brought back to the, to the, to the colony. And, um, and, and one of the major problems with this is that the four-horned sculpin has four horns and the parent birds don't like to hold it. The chicks don't like to eat it. This is a, this is a nest site uh, with a shot taken straight down of a bunch of sculpin that chicks have, have rejected. I've taken the chicks out of this nest site. Um, there, there are a number of reasons why they don't like it uh, in terms of the calories. It isn't that bad compared to Arctic cod. But it's mainly if they get a head like this, a chick gets a head like that in its in its in its stomach, um, it then can't eat anything else for probably the next hour or two. So that so so that the flow through rate is much is much less if they're mean, mainly mainly eating sculpin, and that's probably one of the reasons why they build up the way they do. Because typically the sculpin do disappear from the nest eventually, but it's just that they are waiting for this large cap, large uh, head to be to be to be broken down. So we um, are able to look on a daily basis to see what the percentage is of cod versus sculpin being brought in. And because we now have temperature depth recorders that tell us the actual temperature uh, of the water the birds are feeding in, we now know that essentially once, you, once, once the water gets to be uh, close to two, two, two Celsius, uh, that like Arctic cod start dropping out of the of the picture at around 3.5, they make up 50 percent, and then around four Celsius, it's 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 like mainly sculpin past that point, um, and uh, and this has this has major implications for a range of things. Um, the main being that growth rates and chick survival are much less with sculpin, so that so that so that so the breeding success uh, is. Is, is much lower when sculpin are the primary prey. Um, so, uh, and, and, and you, can, you can kind of see here why a chick eating something like this, I mean, I mean really, 
we when 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 we're uh, weighing chicks, we frequently uh, find scalpin tail sticking out of the chick's mouth because because the head is stuck in the stomach. We would never see that with an Arctic cod. They can apparently go through very 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 quickly. And as I said, uh, the chicks just have these have these sculpin uh, build up in the in the in the nests like that. So, so what this has meant, uh, and this, this just uh, compares the first period of the study when satellite information was available so that we could look at the ice and the, and the, and, and, and the sea surface temperature. From 79 to 84, um, we, had, uh, we had the ice basically adjacent to the island, and we had uh, a sea surface temperature barely above freezing. And we had, we, and, and, and pairs typically raised too, too, too young if you had too young hatch in a nest. Um, uh, for the period of 2003 to 2012, when sculpin had been the primary prey, the temperature has gone up to 3.4 and nestling depth is much higher. Um, uh, since there are too uh, young in the nest, what happens is that as soon as food becomes uh, less and less available, uh, the older chick becomes more aggressive and starts forcing the younger chick to the back of the nest site. If it starts, if, if, if the younger chick doesn't take the clue, you, you get this major aggression where you get wounds and things like that. And, um, and, um, and, and you see brood reduction. And frequently, even after, after the beta chick, even after the, the younger chick dies, you, you then have the alpha chick dying because of, um, uh, because of the fact that, that, the, that the prey isn't, isn't sufficient to even raise one chick. And this is the sort of thing when we first started seeing it on the island, we didn't even know what this was. I thought it had, I thought there was some sort of feather problem, but this is a beta chick whose alpha chick has been basically forcing it to the back of the nest and holding its head saying, okay, you aren't gonna be there at the entrance when the parent comes in. And again, we saw none of that up until, uh, up until, uh, up until the 21st century. And now uh, we've had years where basically, unfortunately, every beta chick will die in a nest, which is one of the very depressing things of coming back to the cabin with my pockets full of chicks that had died. So that's how the increasing temperatures are, are impacting the chicks. Uh, we hadn't thought much about what this is doing to the adults, but we are we have been putting temperature depth recorders on some of the adults so we can uh, every, every two seconds get a, a Get a, get, a, get a depth and a, uh, and a temperature. And what we can see is that when the temperature gets above, when, when, when the sea surface temperature gets above 2C, uh, you, get this, you get this increase in the number of hours that the parents spend underwater when they're provisioning two chicks. And in 2017, which was a very warm year, they were spending up to six hours, close, close to six hours underwater trying to find food for their young. And, and what's important to remember is, is it, isn't, it isn't as if they were doing just as well as these birds down here, that this is when chicks were dying. I mean, they were, they, they were, they were, they were, they were parent birds trying to bring uh, food for their, for their, for the young and almost certainly being unsuccessful in fledging and fledging to, 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 to chicks. This has all sorts of implications in terms of the cost of reproduction for the adults. Um, if you were an adult and you are, are now breeding on Cooper Island and now have to uh, be underwater and be diving uh, to twice, twice, twice as much as in the past, you are going to have you're going to have costs that could that could change your overwinter survival and things like that. So what this says means is that we have seen a, cha a change. Uh, um, does somebody have a question? No, but if we, I don't know how close you are to the end, but we do have a bunch. So if you want to do this slide and then maybe we can do some questions. Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. That'd be good. So, so, like, so like basically what, what, what we've seen um, and had no reason to think when I just started my bird study in 75 is that we saw an ice obligate species switch from its uh, Arctic cod prey base to a, to a, uh, to a, a, a uh, near shore uh, a benthic uh, species. Um, uh, you know, and 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 also suffer as a result because it is such a specialist on Arctic cod, and also because there is no alternate prey that it can feed on. So, sure, if there'd be a question, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm gonna just. Should I stop sharing, or do you think you'll come? 
We can leave it up. Um, so just two, I think, quick clarifying questions that came in, and then I might get to some of the bigger ones. Um, there was a question that just wanted to just wanted to make sure part of the decline we're seeing with the Arctic cod is due to the warming of the water. And so that was the graph you had on the temperature. Mm -hmm. um, they can't, they're not um, successful in the warmer water temperatures. I mean, uh, um, you mean that, I mean, yeah, the Arctic cod basically leaves the, leaves the water column when it gets above um, three Celsius. So yeah, so so I mean that's uh, and 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 yeah, they just aren't available. And it may be a thing also that it's a whole ecosystem thing where there where there's zooplankton populations that the cod are feeding on are not as available. So mm -hmm. so so that it, it it isn't just the cod's tolerance of water temperature. It's also that whatever they're feeding on may not be available. And then there was one other question, very specific to something you had mentioned um, with regarding to the chick feedings. Did you say it happens at least once an hour every hour? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, they are fed, and it all depends on what size the cod are, uh, because I mean, because I mean, because like uh, it, it's all based on the on the on the caloric value. But uh, but but if the uh, if the cod are are you know relatively small, like less than less than ten centimeters, uh, they have to be feeding them uh, once once every hour, which is which is possible if you're feeding within Five kilometers of the uh, of the of the of the island, but again, that is one of the shortcomings that they have is that is that they can't really go any further than five kilometers. So even though there may be prey outside of there, they can't really go to that. Wonderful. Thanks for clarifying those. And then we had some some general questions, um, and they were ones I also found. Um, there were a couple that could. We're wondering if you could speak a bit to what a general day for you looks like on the island. Okay, sure. Yeah, um, I, uh, uh, I mean, I lived in a tent for 28 years out there, uh, and uh, and only only changed after polar bears came in uh, in 2002, uh, uh, and 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 basically ran us out of our camp and wrecked our tents, and we had to be rescued by search and rescue. Um, since, since the guillemots are found at the colony from roughly 10 at night until noon, I sleep from, I try to sleep from, from like roughly, roughly two in the afternoon until 10 at night, which isn't easy to do because it's, 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 it's because it's very bright. Uh, but once you get into that, and then I wake up and try to get out in the colony around midnight when when the birds are most active and, and are and are present at their at their at their nest sites. Um, I you know I I I have like an oatmeal <coughs> breakfast. Um, I go out and walk around the colony, um, looking at uh, looking at the start of the season, seeing who came back and who's and who's breeding with who. So it's basically doing a census as to as to um, um, who has survived the winter? Who has maintained their pair bond? Who has kept that, kept kept their kept kept their nest site? Um, um, and 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 like I then basically work, you know, constantly. I mean, I, I may snack and things like that, but it's basically walking around doing that. Um, and uh, once eggs are being laid, there's a great deal of work to do because I have to I have to measure all the eggs. I have to be very careful about how I get the eggs out of the nest site because their parents. Sometimes um, on them, so so uh, so during that time from mid uh, mid June to mid July, it's mainly looking at hatching success and seeing if the birds are abandoning their eggs, um, and also while I'm doing that, seeing what's happening with birds coming in and prospecting because I will catch non-breeding birds at that point, um, and then um, and then you know uh, and then and then and then ban them. And, but then, but then things really get busy once chick hatching takes place, because I weigh every chick every day now. I used to do it every two days, but things happen so quickly there now. I really want to get that daily variation, and I, um, uh, I, I, I like wake up in the morning. I have a spring scale and I have a rule to uh, to look at their wing length, and walk around. And back when it was close to a 200 uh, pair colony, it was it was a it was a full day job. To, to, to like weigh the, uh, the, the like almost 200 chicks that were, that were present uh, in, the, in, the, in the colony. Um, and then, you know, I'm exhausted. Um, 
uh, and then I uh, I go back to camp. Now I have a I have a I have a I have a cabin with a uh, with a bear fence around it, electric bear fence. Uh, one of the important things is since 2002, I carry a uh, a shotgun constantly. Um, in the past, I would just leave it um, back at the camp. I can't do that anymore. So so that there is a constant vigilance now that it, that makes things very different uh, than 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 in the past uh, in, term, in terms of my, you know, feeling comfortable on the island. Um, yeah, the, that, <laughs> thanks, Laurie. Yes, true devotion to the study um, and thanks for sharing. And I did, I'm gonna um, do a little call out right now. I know he's on, um, good friend of the league and, and supporter, Ken Fabert, um, actually got to join you up on Cooper Island with his daughter a few years ago and then did us the generous favor of writing a blog. Um, so Lois will share the link in the chat. We're gonna include it as well, but it'll give you a little more insight into um, kind of a day or what goes on on Cooper Island. Um, so that's great. And so glad you could join us uh, tonight, Ken. Um, and then you kind of alluded to it a bit here with the mention of um, polar bears starting in about 2002. But there's been a few questions around um, other species in and around the island that you've noticed either changes with or um, how climate has kind of affected those that you've just witnessed um, by your long-term presence. Okay, um, I actually have a few slides on it if you want to see them, if we have that or not. Do you just want me to tell you what happened? It's, yeah, it's up to you, either way. Yeah, actually, I mean, here, so, I mean, do I have to go back to share screen? Yeah. Okay, do you have that? Yep. Okay, so um, so there has been a shift in uh, in horn puffins. Horn puffins didn't used to be around uh, Cooper Island at all. They started uh, kind of circling the island in the eight in the seventies and eighties, and they want to breed in the same cavities that guillemots do. And this is a problem because they're a nest competitor. So they go in and they will uh, push out eggs and kill guillemot nestlings. And th this is a climate change impact on the guillemots. 252 nestlings have been killed by horned puffins. And, you know, and everyone wants puffins to be the you know, charismatic clowns of the sea. But if you're on Cooper Island and you've seen 252 nestlings being killed, you think of them in a different way. But again, it's just a climate change uh, occurrence because they are moving north as the ice retreats. As the ice retreats, the polar bears that are, were typically on the ice are now coming in the group round. And as the first one we saw really close up in 2002 is in this picture. It's taken by Gary, by the, by the, by the late Gary Brosh, who helped the Alaska Wilderness League in many ways, getting photos up there. Um, and, and what has happened, I won't, well, I could show you part of this if you want, but yeah, but we now have polar bears coming up um, on a regular basis. This is a big uh, one that is not scary because he's so well fed. This is a wet one that has just come in off the ocean. And I used to be very much afraid of them, of course. Now I know how to deal with them. I've dealt with them a lot. Uh, but now, now I only feel sorry for them uh, because of the fact that they don't want to be here. They want to be out on the ice um, eat, eat, eating seals, not, not, not messing around with, with, uh, with a seabird's nest and eating, eat, eating chicks that calorically really don't offer them much. So those two, those two shifts that have taken place because of the climate change have, has that, that resulted in a major change uh, or a, a major loss of nestlings over the years, um, which, which is then piled on to the things I was talking about with the, with, the, with the things that were going on with prey. And that is why we then replaced all of the nest cases or all the nest, the wooden nest uh, boxes with these with with these cases, I lived in a cabin, and if someone wants to know what my day was like, days like, that's was it is a it is it is an eight by twelve box. It seems very small the first day I get up there, uh, and Ken and and Ken Faber when he Ken has, is a sailor, he walked into it first day. He said, "It's a boat," because it is. I mean, it's like it's like living in a small living in a small boat. But I got this cabin in two thousand three. I didn't catch on to the fact that I should have gotten cabins for the Guillemots. In 2003, I waited until 2012 and got those nest sites, uh, got, got those uh, plastic nest cases. And now, when you fly over the island, it looks like a Samsonite luggage truck has exploded on it. There are 200 
wouldn't or there are there, there are 200 black uh, nest cases that are that are scattered around the island. And I think that's yeah, that's wonderful. Um, thank you. And then I'm so we I want to get into how this study has really inspired a conversation globally. And I know you have a couple examples, but first I'm going to take a quick minute because um, I want to be able to share with folks how they can uh, get engaged and support and re um, participate in additional programs like this. So allow me to share my screen very quickly. Um, and again, we're putting this on you know, because of all of your support and involvement and really as a thank you to all of you who have joined us tonight. So just wanted to be sure you knew a couple ways that you can continue to be involved with Alaska Wilderness League. Um, right now, as I mentioned, we are at the end of a public comment period for a proposed oil and gas development in the Western Arctic. Um, Cooper Island is a barrier island in the Western Arctic area. Um, and the project is called the Willow Plan and it's in the National Petroleum Reserve, Alaska. I'm sure you've seen a few emails from us and our board member, Debbie Miller, asking you to comment. Uh, so just wanted to take a minute tonight. If you haven't had a chance, um, we're submitting all your comments tomorrow afternoon. Um, and as a coalition, we're currently over 182,000 comments. So it's exciting. Take a minute, add your voice if you haven't. Um, also, um, thanks to so many of you who already do, um, you know, please consider supporting Alaska Wilderness League. And we have the link in here to su support Friends of Cooper Island and all of George's work and his continuing studies. And then just to know what's always going on and the latest um, and to see some really beautiful photos, you can follow us on all our social channels there. Uh, keep Alaska Wild for Facebook and Instagram and at Alaska Wild for Twitter. Um, so yes, my, my shameless geography of hope plug. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, and I alluded to it a little bit in the beginning when I um, did your intro and, and you and I talked a lot about what you've witnessed both through your empirical data and your observations on the island over nearly 50 years, but um, how that's allowed you to, to have these climate conversations on such a broad scale and to really inspire um, others to, to learn and, and understand what's going on, which wasn't something that was happening when this conversation was starting through school students to plays. Um, so I just wanted to really make sure we had an opportunity to touch on that a little bit and for you to share um, how yeah. this- I have a few slides. Place. Would you like to show me show some slides? Um, let me just... I mean, one of the uh, one of the stranger um, okay, do, is that up now? Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, one of the stranger things that happened from this. I mean, after being alone on the island for twenty eight years, and and like basically being a bird person. And then suddenly being a climate change person, um, uh, you know, uh, in 2002, um, uh, I mean, I was on, uh, on on the Late Show with David Letterman, uh, which which was which was like very bizarre, and 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 that was due um, due due to the fact that like Darcy Frey had written an article uh, about my work, um, and that Joe McNally had taken this picture uh, that was on the on the on the cover of the New York Times magazine. Uh, in early 2002, um, I was I was I was blown away by the fact that people were so inspired by this. And I mean I mean and up until last month, I I I encounter people who say, oh by the way, I read the article, or you know, or or like that was the first time I thought about climate change. That was the first thing that made me aware of climate change. And you know I mean that like means a, a like huge amount to me because uh, I mean I mean because clearly I'm very concerned about climate, but I also just, I, I just don't want to like publish papers about uh, about what's going on with seabirds. I want to reach a wide range of people. And I mean, IBM said, hey, could, could we do an ad if we give you a ThinkPad? Uh, can we have you do an ad on where on where do you do your best thinking? And I said, yes, if, you, if it can say on ice that may not be here in 100 years. So so like so like this was in 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 2002 in essentially every major newspaper. 
in it in like the US in the center spread and in many magazines and that people were getting keyed in in 2002 about what was going on with climate change because of that. I was really blown away when the Royal National Theater uh, wanted to do a thing on climate change. And, and I got a call from someone who said, I play you in a, in, in a, in a play being staged at the, at the, at the, at the Royal National Theater about, about climate change. Um, uh, Michael Gould um, was, the, was, the, was the actor who, was, who, had, who, had, uh, who was outfitted uh, with, with fake guillemot poop on his, on, his, on his parka, talking to a younger version of me about what he was seeing on the island and various things like that. And then, I mean, even though the play was not a major hit, though it was written by Jack Thorne, who went on to be a major, uh, you know, collaborator with J.K. Rowling and stuff like that, it was still amazing that, okay, I mean, and here you can even see the Guillemot poop there, that like basically I was, that like, that like what I had done had inspired people. Uh, and there, there was actually, at the end of the play, I didn't realize the polar bear kills me, but it was, uh, it's kind of done off stage, so I haven't been and then as I do that, I mean, like Noah, even uh, Noah was talking about the record uh, climate change from the top of the world after the, the record uh, temperatures in 2015. You know, you can't show uh, ice melting. You can't show snow melting. They show guillemots. So like this is a way for people to relate to, to like Arctic change because it gives them a visual. It gives them a visual that isn't just pack ice retreat and things like that. And this was a very big thing is that EPA contacted me during the Trump administration and said, we'd really like more information about your study. And then as soon as Biden was sworn in, I got a thing saying, we are going to include it in our climate change indicators in the US. And as one of their indicators, it was a closer look, the black little mops of Cooper Brown, so that, so that it was then being used by EPA. Um, so, like, so like that was, you know, incredibly inspiring. And it's the sort of thing that, that like certainly when I'm out on the island alone makes me realize that yes, what I'm doing uh, is having a broader, a broader, a, a broader impact. Um, Absolutely. I, 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 I could talk about the teaching now unless you want to talk about something else. Yeah, I, I was fascinated by some of the, by the teachers in the classroom, um, programs that have come out of it. Yeah, well, uh, Katie Morrison, who, uh, who I first got to know by going to her classroom and teaching her K through six students. And, um, and uh, she has worked with, uh, uh, with an expeditionary artist uh, to have this um, uh, presentation called Witnessing Climate Change. Um, Creole Martin, Rio Creole, Creole Martin has done these great watercolors and they have put together, it was out at Port Townsend, Washington recently. Uh, it's gonna be at other museums also. But, but like, but like uh, there, there's some great uh, graphics like this that are, that, that are being presented to engage people with that. But they have together uh, at, this, at, at a science fair in Seattle had a display where kids were coming up and putting on bracelets with, with color bands. And they would tell the kids what the history of the bird was, like, like wow. what, what like yellow, orange, green was. And it was a way of them of them of them learning about climate change. Uh, Katie also has this great uh, 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 work for her class for cl class plan where she hides uh, cod under these pieces of ice, and the kids <laughs> run up and grab one and take it back, and they keep moving the ice further and further away to say, okay, this is what happens when the ice retreats. And there's this great quote from a kindergarten student that the guillemots may be running out of energy too. You know, so it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, stuff like that is just, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, uh, it, it means a lot. And, and like, I mean, it also means a lot that like Joe McNally came back after, I mean, after, 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 I mean, and Joe McNally is a very famous photographer. He came back to Coop Brown in 2019 to retake his 2001 shot because uh, he and I stayed friends. And I said, Joe, if you come back where I'm stand, where I'm standing in that shot is now just water to the horizon rather than ice. And he came back, it was, it was early July, it was the same time of the year, and he got that shot. Uh, he, got, he, got, he got Nikon to bring a very good, and there is a link from our, uh, from our, from our website uh, to, the, to, the, to the video he made about it. Wow. I mean, when they say an image is worth a thousand words, I think these two combined really do help yeah. tell the story of of the changes you witnessed over 18 years and longer. 
And, uh, you know, I think one of the important things and, you know, and, and, and Tom Campion and Ken Faber and uh, people like that who, who've let me do this, when I go to bird meetings, most bird people are dealing with resource exploitation. I mean, and that, because that's where the birds are. I mean, that, that's, where, that's, 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 that's where the funds are. I find it strange that I go there and I'm, I'm talking about things and I'm not being that uh, big on the fact that they're thinking about drilling offshore in the Chukchi. I'm, I'm very concerned about the fact that, they're, that they may be drilling offshore. And there, there like isn't in the seabird community, though, I mean, I'm certainly, there are some people, but there aren't enough people who are basically, uh, you know, conservationists or certainly people who've seen what I've seen who you say, wait a minute, you can't, you can't, you know, look away from this. I mean, I mean, when you see your colony basically go through a 50 year arc from growing very rapidly to now declining to a level where it might go extinct in the next 20 to 30 years. Um, and, you know, and then people are still talking about, 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 uh, drilling. It's very disconcerting to be on the island listening to KBRW radio, and they're talking about new finds in Alaska where they're going to be drilling. And and I, and this is probably important in terms of the, the whole Arctic refuge issue. It isn't like you can drill safely anywhere, because if you're drilling, it is the oil that gets safely to port or gets gets to the, um, uh, you know, gets to port via the, by the, by the Trans-Alaska pipeline that is then going up and and is basically having this major uh, global impact. It isn't it isn't the one spill one place. It isn't even the isn't the regional impact of 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 drilling in a given area. It's what's happening globally because of the carbon emissions. Yep. And Kathleen, I see your question, and um, we're gonna I'm gonna save that for the end. One uh, penultimate question. George, we did get a little bit. Where do the black guillemots migrate? What is their traditional range? Well, on Cooper. Well, I mean, they actually don't. Uh, they don't migrate at all. They basically uh, stay. I mean, I mean, oh, what they do as soon as breeding is over, they go out to the ice edge. I mean, now they have to go out to the ice edge. In the past, the ice edge was right there. Uh, they go out to the ice edge and they stay with the ice edge all winter. And the ice edge moves into the Bering Sea. Um, and uh, so, so like, so like, so like, they are then found in, in the, in the Bering Sea, uh, or at the Bering Sea ice edge, for basically January through April, and that has been a problem because there have been changes in the Bering Sea ice recently that is changing the adult overwinter survival. But uh, but but they 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 stay in, in the Arctic. They stay in the Chukchi until until the Chukchi Sea is totally ice covered. Uh, and then they then they then they go out into the Bering, um, and then stay there until they fly back north um, in late uh, April. And 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 we have some very good information on that now because we have geolocators that we're putting on the birds that, that have sunrise and sunset time. Um, and if you yeah if you want to contact me or I mean and actually there's a there's a paper uh, that we've written on that that shows um, that shows where where they are by month. Perfect. Um, thank you. And then um, I saw Kathleen had a question and it was something you and I talked about. So when we started uh, this Geography of Hope series now about a, you know, two, I guess this might even be um, right around our two year anniversary, um, which is crazy. You know, we, we really tried to find um, opportunities for hope um, in each one. I know when we've been discussing climate change, um, it can often seem very overwhelming and difficult. And um, so you and I had this conversation, but what what would you either say to take away from the study or what gives you hope um, when kind of facing these larger issues? Well, um, what, what, what gives me hope is, is is the fact that not everyone is saying drill baby drill and various things. Like, I mean, that there are that there's clearly a component of people, and it may be an increasing component of people who are realizing what's going on. Un unfortunately, the pandemic made us realize how we deal with existential threats, and there are some people who don't take them as seriously uh, as they as they as they should. I. I, I feel very much that one needs to live a credible life and live it the way one uh, hopes to, um, 
that, that like one would uh, like to see most everyone else living their life that way. Um, so that in terms of, you know, uses of resources and things like that. But it is, um, uh, I mean, I guess, I mean, I guess uh, what, what I've been hoping on Cooper Island, and it's happened in the past few years, is that, is that, is that the population is now down to uh, a small number of pairs, but they are all birds that are somewhat older and know how to handle things. So there is a, there is a bottleneck going on. And that bottlenecks have happened in the past. They happen all the time when there's these sorts of changes. And that one has to believe in evolution and adaptation because that's, what, uh, that's what's keeping, keep, keep, keeping the colony at this point. I mean, that there are birds who can say, yes, I can feed my young sculpin uh, and, get, and, get, and get by on it. So, so, that, so that at that level, you know, one realizes that yes, I mean, ecosystems have always been resilient um, and species have always been resilient. Um, though, you know, just, just the level of what's going on now globally is, uh, is disconcerting. But um, you know, I but I'm, I'm certainly I'm not despondent. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm going back uh, to Cooper <laughs> this summer, and and like I mean, and I mean, I will be going back until at least fifty years um, because it's going to be uh, well, mainly because it's like you don't abandon something just because it's not doing well, you know, especially something that you've fallen in love with. So that so that isn't like oh, by the way, it's now something that I I don't want to see what's going to happen. Um, I. I want to monitor things, and like I've always been surprised at what's happening next on Cooper. I mean, and, and you know, and, and I don't know what's going to happen next. One of the things that may happen up there is that the subarctic fish, like capelin and sandlets, might come up and be a great food source. Um, so, that, so like that could basically save the colony and be this major switch. Absolutely, and um, I really appreciate you mentioning resiliency. I think it's important and something to keep in mind. One thing that, you know, in our conversations before this program and just listening to, to some more of your talks this evening is just, I'm constantly impressed and what gives me hope is the way that this study that started off without, you know, a, well, before even we were talking in, in the global climate crisis conversation, how it's been able to evolve and adapt and be resilient in and of itself and really inspire such a broad range of people to have this conversation because um, oftentimes maybe it doesn't feel like enough, but if we are not reaching um, new audiences and if we are not sharing information and not talking, then we um, will not be able to move forward. And so this study has done that as you illustrated with so many audiences. Um, so I thank you for that. I can't wait till you hit 50 years um, on Cooper. Um, it is quite an accomplishment. And before I wrap up, yeah, I'll just say if you have any any final words or any last things you'd like to share um, with our audience who has um, given you great feedback on this presentation and we really appreciate it. No, I mean, I think, I mean, and thank you so much for what you just said. And I mean, what I realized, and, and this is true for the last hour or however long you've indulged me, but I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm just thinking about what I'm gonna be saying at Town Hall Seattle next week. Say so like, okay, like we are talking about climate change now. We're talking about this happening. I mean, like, you know, uh, rather than being home watching whatever it is on TV, I mean, like we are at least saying, yes, this is an issue and it should be, and like this gives people a way to talk about climate change and, and you know, and, 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 and people like birds, people like, and also I know people like the fact that there's this, been this idiosyncratic person going up to this island for X number of years. But, but you know, but I mean, it, it like lets them talk about the fact that yes, this, this, this climate change is real, it's going on and it keeps it, in maybe at the forefront of their mind, but it keeps it, it keeps them, it keeps them tuned into the fact that yes, changes are occurring and that we should be aware of them. Absolutely. And we do often say if you're not part of the conversation or the issue is not part of the conversation, um, then your ability to, to achieve change um, hasn't even yet begun. So keep keep it a part of the conversation, keep reaching those audiences. I know there are a couple more questions very specifically about like Guillemont and the study, but I'm gonna use that as an opportunity to plug, as George mentioned, he's actually got some more upcoming talks. Um, so we'll be sure to include those in the follow-up email in case you want to tune in um, and hear some more from George in the coming weeks as he talks to some other groups and mentioned his town in Seattle uh, that's coming up. But I really do wanna thank you for joining us tonight um, and for supporting the league and all our work and all the things you do to make our campaign successful. And then of course, um, 
George, Dr. Devoki, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Uh, it was a really great pleasure and just, yeah, I will echo what's being said in the chat. That's really an amazing chat um, and really loved hearing about your work um, and look forward to, to doing more in the future. Great, thanks very much. It's all been a labor of love. <laughs> thank you, everyone.